Thank you so much for having me. I'd firstly like to start with um, this quote. I hope you can all read it on the screen, screen there. Unruly, wayward, frolicsome, critical, parasitic, at times perverse, malicious, cynical, scornful, unstable. It is at once pervasive, yet big word, base, yet impenetrable. Um, does that mean anything to anyone here? I certainly hope not, because it doesn't to me either. It's just a smart thing that a smart person once said. And if high school taught me anything about making speeches, it's that you start with a quote and you end with one too. Uh, that is the trick of speech making, that as, as well as a heap of others that I'll hopefully be tricking you with today. As well as holding a slideshow remote, there's so much power in holding a slideshow remote because even if you didn't want to see a picture of a uh, semi-naked male suggestively holding a gun surrounded with toys, you have to now. <laughs> so there you go, I have the power and you guys can never unsee that picture. That's a nice one. Mice, you know, giving each other flowers. And the man again. There you go. But um, excuse me for being so rude. I should introduce myself properly. My name is Veronica Milsom. Um, you may know me from something I've done on TV or radio, but you probably don't because I haven't been around for very long. Um, either way, I hope it was a valuable way to spend your time. Um, but. If you've read some of the promotional material, you will know that I am a celebrity of the highest caliber. There's A graders, there's, there's B graders, C, D. I think I'm about D, which means that I can get into expensive nightclubs for free, along with Gemma from Big Brother Season 1 and the celebrity trainer Shannon Ponton, who worked on The Biggest Loser. And if anybody doesn't think that he's famous, well, you are kidding yourself because I accidentally bought... Uh, his special celebrity workout water it cost me 40 cents extra the other day and uh, it, it had a bonus catchy quote, life's great, rip into it, written on it. Five words, two statements and countless inspired fat people. But seriously, it is tough being a celebrity actor and constantly having to make faces like this one. And when I did that facial expression, what I was kind of getting at was... I wanted an, uh, some sort of casting agent to think she could easily be like a naive 16-year-old schoolgirl on Home and Away and just as easily be a drug runner, mid-30s, sexy and mysterious on the next season of Underbelly. I don't know how successful it was. Um, but in terms of being a celebrity, the other day I was uh, in Sports Girl, just browsing around as you do. And I, I saw this group of girls looking at me, ooing and ahhing, looking me once over, kind of going, oh, oh, oh. I thought, here we go, another group of fans. Get out my pen. Turns out uh, they just tried something on and I was in the way of the mirror. <laughs> but their asses did look fat in that and I should have given them some of Ponton's water. But I've been asked to come along today um, to teach you how you can sensibly and accurately use the word satire in a sentence without seeming like an idiot. Um, in the same way that the words literally and like and sick and ironic and asshole are too often used inappropriately in modern day English, so too is the term satire. Now regrettably I've never read any academic papers about the origin of satire and how it came about. But thankfully, I did a bit of research and learnt that it was around the beginning of the second millennium BC in an Egyptian text entitled The Satire of the Trades. But today, I'm going to focus um, more on the use of satire as a comedic device in 21st century pop culture. Uh, satire is one of my favourite comedy genres to write and perform. I like to excuse the expression, take the piss, and um, using satire is a great way to do this. For me, it's about using comedy to show what's considered to be normal or ordinary in society and turning it inside out so that your audience can see it from a new angle, to see that it's weird or wrong or just a bit strange. 
A lot of satire I've written has come from my being outraged about what's considered in the mass media as high-rating popular television, and one of my pet hates is ACA and um, Today Tonight. But I also enjoy taking the mickey out of reality television. Uh, in Australia, we've been blessed with some pretty incredible satire, not that I'm saying I'm a part of it, but um, over the last decades of television, it's been amazing. We've, as an aspiring writer-performer like me, um, there's been some really inspiring television like The Norman Gunston Show, Mother and Son, CNN and N, Fast Forward, Frontline, uh, Glass House, Summer Heights High, We Can Be Heroes, all of Chris Lilly's feats, The Chaser, Kath and Kim, The Librarians, Newstopia, Clark and Dor, and so many more. But as far as one-on-one um, -on -one teachers go, I've been exposed to some of the best in the business. Uh, of the two TV series I've worked on to date, I can count Andrew Denton, Chris and Chaz from The Chaser, and Ben Elton among my bosses and comedy mentors. It's not such a bad way to start, really. Um, the Andrew Denton production was on three seasons of ABC's A Hungry Beast. Uh, it was a show that aims to teach the viewer a whole range of things that they wouldn't have otherwise known. Our audience skewed toward a younger demographic, which was the aim for the ABC, given their current average audience age is 58. No wonder the bill went on for so long. Um, so Hungry Beast was hoping to get in that younger audience. It was a very fast-paced show, and Andrew told the press that the format of the show was unclassifiable due to its chaotic nature, likening it to the internet. But honestly, it was more like a schizophrenic Gen Y with multiple personalities manically switching from page to page on the net. If you play the whole thing at half speed, you'll probably get the vague idea that one of the stories was about an asylum seeker that had something to say about someone who did something on the internet. I'm kidding, it wasn't that bad, but it was pretty fast. Um, I also spent a good part of the start of the year working on the Channel 9 TV show Live from Planet Earth. You know the one that uh, the media crucified Ben Elton for using his 80s stand-up material all over again. But I reckon, how was he to know the groundbreaking dick, fart and fanny jokes he tested in the 80s would be too crude for a 21st century audience? These jokes were 30 years in the making. That's a sad shame. Uh, ben sent me an email the other day, though, asking how I was, and he mentioned he'd moved back to WA and that he's in the, in the middle of writing his new book. I took the opportunity to reply by hilariously inquiring as to whether the plot was about a devilishly handsome British lead male who creates a witty television series misunderstood by the evil, faceless Australian television corporates. He didn't reply, but I'm pretty sure he found it funny, right? Uh, it was an incredibly invaluable experience, though, working on a live sketch television show, even if it only had a run of three episodes. But when I was standing in the wings, um, I would quietly sort of try to convince myself that it was just like theatre, but with half a million people in the audience. And Ben Elton was standing on the sidelines like a proud dad saying, go Ronnie, you're very funny, you'll kill it. Yeah, I think he was more nervous than the rest of us put together. But one of the satirical characters that I really enjoyed playing was a sex therapist. Um, she was sort of like an evangelical motivational speaker. The satire that was intended on being explored was the notion of feminism gone wrong, or too far. This character believed that in order to be sexually liberated and empowered, men should act as women's sex slaves, that they were lesser beings. The direction I remember most clearly from Ben um, when we were workshopping the characters was that he wanted her to be the personification of a pig, to have sort of piggy characteristics. A play on the idea of the chauvinist pig, I imagine. The bit that got cut out of the script at the very last minute, and this was sort of, things got cut out of the scripts with like an hour to go before going live to air on TV. So you, even though you were trying to keep in character, you were like, which bit am I doing? Oh. Um, but the bit that got cut out at the very last minute was the piggiest of all, and it sort of went, you're all beautiful, you're all beautiful, sexy ladies, and any hot guy who doesn't understand that does not deserve to stick his face between your fabulous boobies and go <laughs> And the brr went on for like a minute, and it really hurt your head. Uh, but that was the piggiest bit, and thank God it got cut out, because I did not want half a million people seeing me do that face. You guys are just enough, and that's still too many. But if there's one thing I learned very quickly as a woman working in comedy, it's that you can't be afraid to pull an ugly face. Now, making faces like this one is just part and parcel of the job. 
that was actually a shoot I did um, talking about the cheap thrills that you can get flying with Tiger Airways. <laughs> pretty good. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about the difference between satire and parody, about the amazing fusion they create, but how the two comedic techniques are often confused or reversed in definition. Now, part of this may be related to the fact that satire sometimes uses parody as a tool for getting humour across. A major distinction between parody and satire are their goals. Their purposes can be very different. While satire explores an anger or frustration at the status quo using humour as a tool to make the subject palatable, Parody doesn't necessarily have to be making a point or inciting change. It can be used purely for entertainment through extreme portrayals or established ideas or characters. Um, so this parody of one of Nigella's cooking shows focuses on a physical exaggeration of Nigella's best known characteristics. Her voluptuous breasts, her big hair, smouldering eyes, the sexy way she carries herself in the kitchen coupled with overt innuendo in the content of her speech. But the fact that the words that the character was delivering weren't satirical, I think were probably the character's greatest downfall. A satirical interpretation of Nigella Lawson would have made fun of her shortcomings in an ironic sort of fashion and held them up to ridicule. It could have made fun of the fact that she's a homeschooled chef without an ounce of real credibility. She creates meals using mostly prepackaged goods and appeals to the lazy 21st century cook. Anybody and everybody can become a celebrity chef and there's currently an abundance of them. Um, to back up my claim, I just wanted to show you this picture of one of the meals from her recipe book. It's quite simply spaghetti with marmite stirred through. <laughs> Delicious, but not worth putting in a cookbook, Nigella. Uh, another character that I developed and featured on Hungry Beast was a fusion of both parody and satire. She was a Walkley Award winning current affairs journalist who explored news issues of a different sort. The invention of this character existed before Hungry Beast ever did. Andrew liked it and decided to include it in the regular lineup. In fact, the original package I showed to Andrew involved this character, Victoria Dynamite, investigating a popular sexual fetish that I invented called obesity, people who like to have sex with fat animals. I was surprised that he liked it and wanted to go with it. And Victoria investigated the rising number of refugees on our shores. In it, I was attempting to comment on the subtle undercurrent of racism I feel exists in some current affairs reports. I was also hoping to show how biased and ill-informed the reports often are. A lot of the scripting for this sketch was taken word for word from Today Tonight and current affairs reports, as was the graphics and images. But by exaggerating them, it made for comedy. But the greatest challenge that I faced was that their reporting was often so biased, absurd and ridiculous that the more sensationalised the reports became, the more they're sort of parodying themselves. I watched an amazing report on a current affair the other day about Indian minor birds. Now, I don't know if this was in my head. I'm pretty sure it wasn't, but I thought it was a glaringly obvious racist parallel. Talking about their invasion into society, the way they destroyed life for normal native Australian birds by coming through our back doors, they even said back doors, and eating away at our resources. Now, even if I was reading it into an honest report, it could have been quite a good satirical piece about uber-conservative reporting on an increasingly multicultural nation. But the use of satire and parody is not uncommon at the ABC, not only because they're great comedic devices, but also because it's the easiest way to get footage cleared through the ABC editorial policy. <laughs> And believe me, you're always trying to find ways to get um, content past the iron fists of the ABC Ed Poll guidelines. It's the reason in Hungry Beast season one we managed a satirical joke about a man who's the victim of an Australian netball team group sex scandal, but we can't manage to show footage of a semi-erect penis on more than a 45 degree angle until it's an MA time slot. Who'd have thunk? That's true, you know. Uh, there are classification guidelines at the ABC which mean the legal team has to uh, watch footage back with a ruler in hand and measure the angle of an erect penis and determine its appropriateness for that time slot. I'm pretty sure that's not written into the job description. But even par um, satire and parody scripts that have been cleared under the ABC editorial guidelines can be determined as grossly inappropriate by the mass populace. Take, for example, the very well-known Make-A-Wish sketch. 
It received so much criticism that it was taken off air for two weeks and received an unprecedented amount of press. Although it was the first time the ABC government broadcaster had spent our money poking fun at sick kids, it's certainly not the first time it's been explored and loved by many. The difference, though, is in the comedy targets. Now, this is where Chaz, one of the members of The Chaser, believes they went wrong. He told me he thought the script wasn't funny enough or making enough of a satirical point. As Andrew Denton would later teach me, you can't have a weak target. We'll get to targets in a tick, but um, let's first have a look now. Actually, I'm not sure if I have time. I was going to go into showing you um, Ricky Gervais in an episode of Extras. Uh, no, I don't have time. But he, he um, basically what he did was he used himself as the comedy target when he was talking to a sick kid. So he, um, he made himself like, look like an idiot as this famous actor um, trying to impress the sick kid. And it was, it was obvious from the viewer's point of view, you were left with no doubt that it was, too, it was an idiot visiting the sick boy and not the boy himself who was the target of the ridicule which I think maybe was where the Chaser's Make-A-Wish make sketch was hazy. But the term targets is bandied around a lot in comedy writers' rooms. In order for a satirical joke to be funny, it needs to have a strong target most of the time, unless you're Trey Parker and Matt Stone, the writers of South Park. But as a satirical comedy writer, it's easy to get carried away sitting in a dark room with a laptop trying to t make jokes um, at the next inappropriate level. It sort of requires a degree of objectivity and personal detachment before you can decide if a joke was incredibly unfair and if your target was all wrong. I remember one instance in particular working on Hungry Beast when the inquiry into, um, into the Victorian bushfires was happening and Christine Nixon, the then Victorian police commissioner, had been discovered to be eating dinner at a restaurant after she'd found out that the fires were happening. Now, as we were going around the writer's room table, reading out jokes, that we'd written for this week's show, I got out mine, which I'd written in a dark room on a laptop all alone. And there was one in particular um, that I read out, which the idea was supposed to be that it was a parody of a celebrity endorsed barbecue restaurant, of which Christine Nixon was the celebrity. And the menu comprised mostly of flame grilled items, sizzling hot something else's. It got pretty ugly and I can't even read it out because I've destroyed every copy I owned. Andrew said the script was very quiet, which in writer's room code means not funny or just really shit. Um, I see now that the script was in poor taste and inappropriate and I had a chat later with Andrew about the target. In this case, Christine Nixon and the victims of the bush bushfires were definitely a very weak target for comedy. But some of the best and safest targets for satirical comedy are those who are empowered, like politicians, rich people, white people, corporations, as long as they don't sue you, and the government. The more general, the more empowered, the safer and easier. But many comedians like um, the Brit Chris Morris believes there is no line in comedy, so it can't be crossed. As long as it's funny, it's fair game. His satirical comedy show Brass Eye aired on the BBC about 10 years ago. It was adored by millions and abhorred by as many. The final episode he did featured a special edition and collection of satirical sketches around the media's coverage of pedophilia. I mean, obviously the context in which uh, the content was aired is particularly relevant. And this was coming off the back of a campaign by media organisation News of the World uh, to try to get the government to allow controlled access to the sex offenders register so parents with young children could know if a sex offender was living in their area. Now, this was in response to a high-profile pedophile, um, pedophilia and murder case. But defenders of Chris Morris say he was making relevant and salient satirical points about media hysterica hysteria and hypocrisy um, on the subject of pedophilia. He was playing with the media stereotype of pedophiles and the culture of fear that it breeds. In this sketch, the target for the jokes weren't the pedophiles or the victims of pedophilia, but the media's coverage of these. Needless to say, it ruffled many fe feathers, caused moral outrage, government ministers weighed in on it, and the BBC received a record number of complaints. Now, while satire is often described as using wit as a weapon for socio-political change, it rarely actually creates social or political change, particularly to do with government policy. But I don't think that's its principal intention. From where I stand as a young comedy writer, I believe as long as good satire makes you firstly laugh and secondly think, then I think it's done its job. 
So I hope by now that you'll be more confident in the use of the words satire and parody in your everyday speech and that you can feel free to apply them as shown in any one of the sentences you say in the next 10 to 15 minutes as you mill around getting coffee. Also, I wanted to show you the quote from the beginning so that we've gone full circle. Thanks.